was a very kind thing to say. Thank you. I wish you hadn't said it just before I got up. May I just tell you how glad I am to see all of you here tonight. We have a good crowd of people. You're in an assembly tonight where the truth is held. And that's not a small thing. And, and I'm just so comfortable with you because I'm in an atmosphere of people who believe there's such a thing as truth. Postmodern theory that is just the pablum of our secular universities, I'm telling you, has as, at its root the idea that there is no absolute universal truth. You must always believe this, that the Bible is absolute universal truth. It's universal in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. You know what that is? That's universal truth. And it's absolute because it involves eternity. I don't know how you'd get more absolute than that. It involves eternity. And you're in a crowd of people tonight. You're in a, in a company of people tonight who love the Lord God and who believe in absolute truth. And when we talk about higher ground with reference to our marriages, and that's what I came to talk about tonight, it's very, very comfortable, I think, in the world to believe that the difference between Christians and world, and incidentally, you know, first century when the Lord was on the earth, you had two distinctions of people, two categories of people into which the Lord would put people. There were the Jews and the Gentiles. In other words, I mean, there were the Jews and then everybody else. Everybody else were the Gentiles. Well, that's true today. Not with those same names, but it's, it's Christians and the world. Christians in the world. In James 4 and 4, don't love the world. It, it, 1 John 2 and 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And when I say tonight, I'm going to talk about some more about the world tomorrow, and I'm really looking forward to that lecture. But, I, but when I talk about rising above, higher ground with reference to our marriages, I'm talking about Christian marriage in contrast to worldly marriage. Now, when I was, when I was young, I learned that evil can be learned in three different ways. You can learn evil by experimentation, right? Well, how do I know whether or not I will enjoy drugs, illicit drugs, unless I try them? How do I know that I will, whether or not I will like premarital sex unless I try that? What? And you can just make the list. It's a fool's way to learn evil. It's a fool's way. Experimentation. The second is observation. That is, I can watch other people and how their lives turn out when they follow particular courses of action. Observation. And then the third would be revelation. Now, there's the best. There's the best. I don't have to experiment with evil to know what it is. Brother Holland used to say, BJ, remember this? He would say, I don't have to put my head in a trash can to know what garbage is. And how blessed we are to have the Word of God. And one great reason is because I, I can learn what evil is, but I didn't come to talk about Revelation so much tonight. Obviously, we're going to discuss that, but in the next few minutes, and our time is so messed up, I guess I could speak as long as, what time should I stop at? A quarter till? Yeah, quarter, about a quarter till? Okay, great. That's fine. Thank you. Can I pay you later? Let's talk about observation. What I want to do is to, to make comparisons tonight between Christian marriage and, the, and worldly marriage. And, and I'm going to give you half a dozen comparisons. Now, do not, do not misunderstand me. There's really no comparison. I just want to tell you something from my heart, which is this. Now, I've been married for 41 years. How do you like that? To the same woman. And God has richly blessed me. But in reference to Christian marriages, to marriage in general. I'm telling you that, that God has given us his very best. Would you just write that in your heart? That really is the point of this session, that God has given us his very best. Number one, there is a difference in the beginning of marriage. Now, I'm not talking about when God originated marriage in the garden. I'm talking about when people, people like you and me, first get married. Remember when you first got married, those of you who are? That first year can be the most challenging in some ways. So many decisions to make. And the truth is that Cindy and I, we made, we made some decisions that have stuck. I do not think that Mrs. Colley has ever gotten on the back of a lawnmower. I mean, all these years, I don't think she has. And you know why? 
because I volunteered that first day. I'll cut the grass and here we are. I think that you set things in motion, you know. And a lot of, that, a lot of that's going to stick with you. And, and I, by the way, I like to cut the grass and that's fine with me. There's a difference between people of the world and people who are in the scriptures. It is true that people of the world sometimes are influenced by scriptures and sometimes a person who's not a Christian will get some Christian counseling prior to marriage and they'll learn some of these principles. But what I want to say is this, there's a tremendous advantage to a child who's been reared in a Christian home like Cliff was talking about before he gets married. You know why? Ready? The best husband in the world is a faithful Christian. Just let that soak in. Is that a true statement? Think about the things that make a great husband. I'm telling you, it's about being a faithful Christian. The best wife in the world is a faithful Christian. And you grow up in a home that is, is full of the scripture. Cindy and I talk about the Bible all through the day. You, you grew up in a Christian home and what happens is you already know the, princ the principles of great marriage even, even before you start talking about marriage. I mean, you think about 1 Corinthians 13, there's the love chapter. You know, you can, you can draw a line and connect that over to Ephesians 5 and 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her. The word love there, husbands, love your wives, is agape. You probably know that. But it's also agape in the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 actually, in application, is about spiritual gifts. And you probably know that. But you may not know this is agape love. So beginning about verse 4, Take these principles. This is not about marriage, but I declare it's about being a faithful Christian. You raise kids like this, and I'm going to say that they're going to know a lot about having successful marriages before you talk about marriage. Love suffers long. That means I'm going to be patient with your weaknesses. How long were you married to your husband before you knew he had flaws? Yeah? He's, got his, he's got that chair in the bedroom and his closet mixed up. How come he always has his socks and t-shirts on the floor? Why? Why does he do that? How long before you knew your wife had flaws? And how come, how come she can't remember to charge her cell phone? And she doesn't know where it is half the time. I can't reach it. Why do I spend all that money on that cell phone? You're laughing because you're married to one. That's why. How long? I'm going to tell you something. You'll never see the backside of a good marriage if you're not patient. But I learned that before I, before I got married. Love suffers long and is kind. What is, the, what is the tone of your home tonight? Ephesians 4 and 32, right? Be kind one to another, tenderhearted. That's not about marriage, it's about being a Christian. It's about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, is that just, just describe your marriage, this is how it is right now at your home. Why not? What I'm saying is be a faithful Christian and you'll be a great husband. You'll be a great wife. Love suffers long and is kind. Love vaunts not itself, it's not puffed up. You take a person who's inflated with his own importance and he's going to have a hard time apologizing. You, you'll never have a good marriage if you don't know how to apologize. Is that a true statement, old timers? Yeah, is that a true statement? Yeah, it is. You think, about, you think about a person in a marriage who always has to be right, even when he's wrong. He's too pride, prideful. Love suffers long in this kind. Love envies not. It's not, doesn't vaunt itself puffed up. Doesn't behave itself unseemly and seeks not his own. You, you let selfishness elbow its way into the marriage and what if it elbows its way into your finances and suddenly, you know when people have trouble with their finances in marriage, you know when it causes trouble? You might say, well, it's when you don't have enough of it. And I know that can be uncomfortable. I've experienced that, but that's not the answer. When, when, when the problem comes in marriage with money, it's when one spouse starts feeling that the other one is using our money selfishly. Come home with that boat, you know. What's the boat doing behind the truck? It was a great deal. Bought it from the boss. I really bought it for you, honey. I really did. And you, you, you got trouble, right? You, you let selfishness come into your, the intimacy of your marriage and you see what happens then. But this chapter is not about marriage. This chapter is about being a faithful Christian. Anyway, the, the last one on this list that I wanted to point out in the list of, of qualities of love, believes all things. Do you ever think about that? The significance of believes all things is that I'm going to ascribe to my, in the context of our discussion, I'm going to ascribe to my spouse good motives even when she does something wrong. I mean, if she ever does. I want to be treated like that. 
because there are going to be times in my life when I do things that are contrary to who I really am. And what a blessing and what a loving blessing to have a spouse who says something to this effect. I know, you, I know that that's what happened and I know that you know that was a wrong thing, but I also know that that is inconsistent with your character and who you are. And I know that's not who you are. That's not who you are. That's very precious, isn't it? Now, this, all I'm saying, here's the point. That's the first point. And I can't take this much time with each, but I'm going to tell you something. There's, there's no comparison between a worldly relationship, marriage, and a Christian marriage. In the first place, in reference to how we're prepared for marriage. And a person who's grown up in a Christian home knowing the Bible is a, is a country mile ahead. Now, here's number two. A, a heterosexual marriage in God is better than a homosexual marriage. I'm really surprised that I even had to say that. My grandfather preached a long time. He died when I was a little boy. He's a great gospel preacher, debater. I doubt he ever preached a sermon in which he said a sentence like the one I just said. That this is a new day, isn't it? It's a new day. That's true in reference to the design of God for, for males and females. I don't recall being in a church building where we didn't have two restrooms instead of just one. You know why that's true? Because we're very different and we're sensitive to those realities because some people are biologically male and some are biologically female. And we understand that that's a statement from God. See, that's how we view that thing. It's a statement from, we can shake our fist at heaven if we want to, but that's a statement from God. And, and, and one of the spouses has a body capable of bearing children, and the other has a body capable of facilitating that. And that's a design, a design for union. Heterosexual marriage is better because of, of what is natural. Now, I want you to ponder this with me for a minute. Who gets to decide what is natural? Who, who gets to decide what is natural? You know, you know, the answer in, in this postmodern world of ours would be that everybody gets to decide for himself. There's no truth, you know, not really, not universal truth. What's true for you may not be true for me. It all ultimately comes down to my own personal preferences. No. No, not in, I mean, that's true about ice cream, but it's not true about what we're talking about right now. And so in Romans chapter 1 in 26, when Paul is arguing, this point, and he's, he raises the subject of homosexuality, and he says, he says, men with men doing that which is, they left the natural, listen to the language, they left the natural use of the woman and burned in their lust one toward another, men with men doing what is unnatural, it is unnatural. Who gets to say? Well, I would, I would suppose that the one who created the human race in the beginning gets to say what's natural, wouldn't you? It's not natural. Heterosexual is right because of child rearing. I, I, I applaud single mothers who are Christians and, are, and working to be both a father and a mother and raise their kids in the Lord. And we have some at West Huntsville and God bless them. I, I love those, those families. Those little, they're doing the best they know how, the best they can. But a mama's never gonna be a daddy. She can't. She's not a daddy any more than a daddy can be a mama. He can't. It's, it's interesting, I talked to someone on the phone today about this subject and she made the observation that, that a dad knows how to rough house with kids. That's a really wonderful thing too, you know. He knows how to rough house with a boy. And he's teaching him all sorts of lessons, you know, about strength, about his strength, about, but he also teaches about lines that you draw. We're not going to hurt anybody, not really. We're going to roughhouse, but nobody's going to get hurt, at least not too bad. Men and women are different, and that's best about child rearing. When you, when you were a kid and you skinned your knee, who did you go to first? You went to your mama, because she would say, I'm just so sorry you hurt you. Come here, let me kiss you and hug you and pat you, and let's get some Bactine. That's what we used when I was a kid. And, and then my grandchildren think that, that Band-Aids fix everything. They're rather miraculous. And, You'd go to your father if you wanted to, but what he would say is, well, just rub a little dirt in it and get back to playing. Come on, let's go. I'm just saying that we need both, don't we? We need a mom and a daddy. 
higher ground in reference to marriage is a Christian marriage in contrast to the world. Homosexual marriage is dangerous for your loved ones and it's dangerous for the church. Right now we're experiencing quite a large number of churches who are having occasionally someone come out of the closet. It's very traumatic for the whole congregation, of course, but I don't consider that to be our greatest threat. Our greatest threat is not Romans 1 and 26, it's Romans 1 and 32, because verse 32 says that it's not merely those who commit the sin of homosexuality that are worthy of, of death, that's eternal death. It's those who, who tolerate or who endorse this. Now I'm gonna tell you something, that's where the devil's gonna hurt the church because there already is. You raise your kids in, in schools, you know that, that are warned against talking anything in favor of Christianity. You can't, you can't teach the sanity of good marriage, of right marriage, of God approved marriage. What you can teach is tolerance of anything, including, of course, what we're talking about right now. This is a contrast. I, I want to live on higher ground. I came to say tonight that God has given us, Christians, in reference to marriage, his very best. Here's number three. <laughs> marriage is better than living together. The world, the world prefers living together. We have one ethnic group, very significant, large ethnic group, and statistically, and this has been holding true for quite a number of years, right at 80% of the children born to that category of Americans are born to, to parents who are not married. Now you can, you can figure out why that happened. I do not know, but I can tell you one thing. The kinds of problems that we're facing right now surely are connected to the fact that the families are either non-existent or are, are distorted. Being married is not the same thing as living together. First Corinthians seven and verse Two, to avoid fornication. Fornication is sexual sin. It's an umbrella term for sexual sin. To avoid that, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. People say, I mean people in the world, worldly philosophy would say, that's just a piece of paper. You see, we are a little above that. It's kind of enlightened, I think. And, and our marriage is not based on a piece of paper. Our marriage is based on love. And you hear that and you say, you know what, That's, isn't that nice? That sounds real good. They love one another. It's, it's, uh, it's sweet, but it's rubbish. See, the world's view about marriage is that your, your marriage is sustained by your love. Are you hearing me? Your marriage is sustained by your love. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches that your love is sustained by your marriage. The fact is that you made a contract. Now you go to, you go and you, you go to the courthouse. If you live in America, this is how we do it legally. Go to courthouse and you get a, a document and then both of you put your name on the document. Now I want you to appreciate the fact that when you sign that marriage license, you're not promising how you will feel in 50 years. You can't predict that anyhow. You're not promising how you will feel. You're promising how you will behave. In fifth, and when you make your marriage vows, we take traditional marriage vows, and what do you say? In sickness and in health, in adversity and prosperity, and forsaking all others to be faithful to you and to you only until death do us part, what you're promising is how you will behave. I declare. Countless marriages, you'll know this is true when I say it, have survived through very difficult times and come out on the other side because of that piece of paper. And a passage of scripture uttered by our Lord and people who grow up knowing the scriptures, who learn the scriptures. Matthew 4 and verse 4, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And people who respect the word of God this way Know that Matthew 19 and 9 says, whoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and marry another commits adultery. How many people have, have made the difficult decision under pressure to not commit adultery and to not divorce and to, to just hang on until things got better because of that piece of paper and because of those scriptures. A woman which has a husband 
is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. Here's number 4. A faithful marriage is better than having an affair. I, I've been around, uh, I've never committed adultery. I've been around it a lot in, in uh, counseling. I mean a lot, I guess I'm around it every week. And um, my perspective, uh, I think may be different as a result of that because I don't, I don't see it when, when you have the fireworks, I don't see it when there's joy in this this covert relationship that's given, taken, the electric conversations that people, I said, I don't see that. I don't ever see that. I see it on the other end. I, I see it when a man will say things like, Brother Collie, I would crawl on glass if I could get back to her. Or a man said to me the other day, a Christian man, he said, I would, if, I could, if I could just give my right arm to have my marriage back again, after my adultery, if I, I would give my arm without flinching. That's, 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 that's the part that I see. When uh, Caleb was younger, a, a teenager, uh, he uh, worked for a small newspaper. And because he, he was a high school student and because we were homeschoolers, he was able to do the hours and it worked out just great. He got a lot of good experience. And, and he was able to go and cover the and we lived in, in Collierville, Tennessee, and he covered the Grizzlies, the NBA team, the Grizzlies. And so I would go take pictures for him, and he would go. And we would, we would sit on the court side. We watched those professional basketball players play. And I remember thinking and about some of those guys. Some of them were married, and they, they were straight-up kind of guys. They were all just terrific athletes. But some of them were really clean-living kind of fellows. And there was others of them that were players, not just on the court, but I'm telling you, they had women at every, every place they would go. And I can remember at the time, I'm just not around that very much and seeing that, but I remember getting in my car with Caleb, our little car, we had so much fun, and, and he admires me. He, he admired me then, and I'm his dad, and, and we have always been, always been very close. And driving home, and I thought, I've got my boy here in my car, and he respects me. And he knows that I'm never going to forsake him. He can trust me. And I'm going to go home to my wife. And we're going to sleep in the same bed together. And in the morning, I'm going to wake up and, and get up. And I won't have to worry about guilt or who might find out about it. I frankly don't care who finds out about me sleeping with my wife. I don't care about that. I, and I, I'm not going to, to worry about any kind of disease or unwanted pregnancy. We always thought pregnancy was a great thing. Now, you, you hear what I'm saying. I want to rise above the world. And this is the logic that I, I, could, I could simply show you what Scripture says. And, of course, that's the most important thing is revelation. But I'm saying tonight that just by observation, just by observation, staying away from God in reference to marriage is not going to end well. It never does end well. Here's the next one. Christian marriage, in contrast to worldly marriage, involves sharing the Lord. Now, now people of the world don't understand this, but, but Cindy and I have been married a long, long time, and, and I treasure, this may sound kind of silly, but we sit on the same pew until I get up to preach. We sit on the same pew, and our legs, we're, we're sit close together. Our legs are touching. And sometimes I'll put my arm around her. That's not a... That's not a sexual thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, a spiritual thing. We're worshiping God together. It's frankly a little challenging. I'm a very good bass singer. I'm good. I am so good. But, but hitting all my notes just right when Mrs. Collie is not sitting beside me is frankly kind of a challenge now because we've been worshiping side by side for a lot of years. And at night, every night, every night, when, when we're home together, we're going to pray together. We always do, and, and she will, it's not uncommon for her to say before I start to lead the prayer, she'll say, now Glenn, don't forget, we need to pray for brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, and don't forget now this, this child, yes, okay, that's right, that's right. So, so we're praying together in that way. We talk about scripture. We talk about scripture through the day. We share the Lord. We, it, in my house, and I'm, I'm just saying, we, we don't, 
There's never a hesitancy to, to, to name the name of Jesus, to talk about Jesus. And what would Jesus want us to do about this? What would Jesus think about this? Now, I understand the world doesn't get that. They, they don't know. I'm just saying to you because I know you do get it. You must never forget that we rise above the world. And what God has given us in reference to marriage is his very best. This is his very best. Now, here's the last one. And, and I'll have just enough time to do it before Wade gets rude. In Christian marriage, we, we know how to say goodbye at the end. People who are of the world are the same as Christians in what they say beside the open casket of their spouse. We say the same thing. We say, he's gone to a better place, or I'm just so thankful that she's where she's not hurting anymore. And so you might look at those two scenes, Christian, unbeliever, and you might say, well, see, they're the same. There's no difference. Oh, oh no, 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 that's not true. And what I'm about to say, please do not take as being cruel. I don't mean to be cruel to anybody. But Galatians 6 and 7, I suppose, was written for an occasion such as this. And the Bible says God's not mocked. You, you, may, you may mock people. You may mock the police, your teachers. You may mock the teachers. You may mock your parents. But you're never going to mock God, not successfully. God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Let me tell you about Christians. They know how to hurt at the death of a loved one. Yesterday I, I sat with a sweet couple and she's got cancer. She, they're faithful Christians and dear friends of mine. And, you know, you go through a year of chemo and you really fight because you've got some hope and you, it's hard, it's been tough. It's tough, but you go through it. And you, you get to the end and they run a CAT scan and a PET scan and there's some more spots. You feel like you went back to the beginning. And Christians know how to hurt and they hurt. But I'm going to tell you something. Christians are different because of the Word of God. And Christians don't have to pretend. They don't have to pretend. There's a difference. And I, I, you'll understand the point that I'm making, but there's a difference. At the funeral, and I, I went to a funeral of a good friend's mother the other day, and, and there wasn't anything religious really about it. Maybe a couple of references to God, but not that. I mean, all the music was secular, every bit of it. There's a difference in, in having music at a person's funeral. It's, it's Elvis singing, or I did it my way. Huh? Or maybe Frank. Frank did that song. Oh, Oh, he could sing. And let's, what if we do that? I did it my way. There's, there's a difference between that and having Christians gather around a casket and sing. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith, we can see it afar. That's different. Don't you tell me that's not different. And Christians bury their loved ones. I heard an old preacher say one time over the over a new-made grave of a faithful Christian is a rainbow. Now, I got a couple of minutes. You know what? We're gonna know one another in heaven. Now, I understand Matthew chapter 22, our Lord said in verse 29 and 30 that, that we're going to be like, in the resurrection, we'll be like the angels. Now, we're not gonna be angels, we'll be like the angels who are neither married nor given in marriage. Given in marriage would be the daddies, you know, you, but you're not gonna hear a, a father say in heaven, her mother and I, that's not gonna happen. Now, we're not going to be married, but, but I, I believe that has reference to do with the fact that we're not going to have our physical bodies. So there won't be a reproductive system, and you won't have babies born in heaven. And, and, but I'm convinced we're going to know one another in heaven. That's very important to me. It's very important to me because, I, because I'm Glenn Colley. And my life has been rather dominated, if you please, by the fact that I married Cindy. We were freed hard of a couple of kids and the very idea that we could make that decision when we were 20 years old, but we did. And that, that's uh, in a very significant way that has impacted my life. And to think about going into eternity and not knowing her, I'm not going to be, we're not going to be married in that way. Maybe Romans chapter 7, a woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. There's not marriage on the other side. But I take that to mean the physical relationship. Not, not married like that, but, but we're going to know one another in heaven, aren't we? 
Matthew 8 and verse 11, many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down together with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What difference would it make that we would know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven if we, if we couldn't recognize them when we got there? Genesis 25 and verse 8, and Abraham died an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. They didn't take him back to Ur of the Chaldees from whence he came. That's not, who's that talking about? It's talking about God's people. He assembled with God's people. What difference would it make that we were with God's people if we couldn't recognize one another? It wouldn't matter at all. But I'll tell you one more thing. If the Bible teaches in John 5 and 28 that, that when the trumpet blows, when it's time, that all that are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good the resurrection of life, they that have done evil the resurrection of damnation. Why is he going to do that? Why do you suppose he's going to raise the dead? I mean, Ecclesiastes 12 says, the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. It's the spirit. The spirit's going to go to be with the Lord. And why do you suppose he needs to raise the dead? I mean, the bodies. The body without the spirit is dead, James 2 and 26. Why does he need to re resurrect the body? What does he need it for? And in some cases, you can use your imagination. It's going to be a great challenge. You go out and plow a field out here? Don't you suppose many plow boys, barefooted plow boys, have plowed through somebody's dust and didn't even know it? Why does he need to resurrect the body? 1 Corinthians 15, you know, about verse 50 and following, says this corruptible is going to put an in, in corruption. This mortal body is going to put on immortality. And we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Why? Why do, we, why do we need the physical body? And I do not know the answer definitively. I don't know the answer. Maybe one of the brethren who's going to preach tomorrow, smarter than me, will tell us. But I believe it's this. He wants to communicate that it's going to be me. That when I go to the other side, I'm not going to be somebody else. I'm not merely going to be an entity, an eternal entity. I'm going to be me. I'm going to be Glenn Colley. And that I will have a memory Luke 16, won't I? I'll be able to remember. I, I, I went around all that circle to get to this point, and I'm going to stop, and that is this. Christians understand about the other side, and when they kiss that, there's going to come a time in our marriages, and some of you have already experienced this, when one spouse is going to gently lay the hand of the other into the hand of Jesus. Cindy and I have agreed that we, we both want to go first. I won't be worth shooting. But I'm going to tell you this. I anticipate being in heaven with that girl for all eternity. I can say goodbye for a while. She can say goodbye for a while. And, and there's a place. My Lord said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's a real place. I've seen it by faith. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. Do not tell me that there's any competition between the world and what she's doing with marriage and what the Lord has given us in marriage. I'm going to tell you right now, God has saved his very best for us. Thank you, and God bless you.